I'll give you an example. So I'm on the phone. I have my earbuds in. I'm on a call. And if it makes you feel any better, I used to sell chemical lawn treatments. Fun stuff. Hey, podcast listener, even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable location independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Oh, yeah. Welcome back to the TMBA pod. Of course, this is the show where we talk about getting more personal and financial freedom through growing a successful lifestyle business. And by lifestyle business, I don't mean small. I mean just that that business serves your interest and takes into account for more things than just the bottom line. But that doesn't mean the bottom line has to be small. Today's guest is an example of that. He's got close to 60 employees. He's growing this remote team and he travels a lot. I've seen him in so many different countries now, both for business and for lifestyle reasons. And we are going to dig into how that happens here today. Yes, today's guest is Justin Cook of the Empire Flippers. I've been wanting to do this one for quite some time. And uh, I knew that Justin and I would both be in Chiang Mai this time of year. So I wanted to wait until we could sit down in person and get some of the backstory of what's been going on with the Empire Flippers. Most listeners of this program will know the Empire Flippers marketplace as a place to buy and sell businesses, but it wasn't always like that. And, you know, we talk about like the thousand day principle on this show, you know, getting to that moment where you can pay yourself as much as you'd be making back in a professional job. One thing we don't focus on too much is what happens before those thousand days. And that can be a lot longer than a thousand days. In fact, it could be decades leading up to your entrepreneurial moment, the moment that you jump off and start building your own business. So with Justin, one of the things I wanted to do today is dig in a little bit into his backstory and just get a sense for, you know, sometimes it can be tough when you like look at a 60 person business that's 100% remote and is making millions and millions of dollars a year. And you think, man, like, how can I get there? And well, maybe today's episode can give you a little bit of insight on how you can craft your lifestyle business story. So Justin Cook is a co-founder of the Empire Flippers. His business partner, Joe Magnati, will also be mentioned a lot on this show. We got this conversation rolling with a, a crucial question, which is who does what in this partnership? The answer to that, plus a wide ranging conversation into the backstory of this enormous success story on today's app. So what do you say we get it rolling? It's been a battle, to be honest with you, because there's a problem when you have two founders and two partners on who controls what, right? And so it can be, for both of us, I think, stressful in that you know until we kind of like establish the law and like who owns what there's some push and pull there's some battle between us we have our roles pretty well defined right now so i'm in charge of marketing also in charge of operations whereas joe fills the ceo role and he runs sales and then accounting and billing and hr so we've kind of like determined those departments but it's been a journey getting there so you see yourself as a marketer I do. What's that mean? So as I view my role now, I'm in charge of, I think, kind of like bigger marketing goals, right? And I think I'm also in charge of protecting our brand and our trust. Any business meeting, we're talking about new initiatives or how we should approach something. I try to add value when I can, but I really hold my kind of like (laughs) my hammer back for the things that I think would either hurt trust or hurt our brand. I feel like I do that a lot in our business too. Is there an example that pops in your head of like things that maybe other companies would do that you're not willing to do? Yeah. An example of that might be there are other people in our industry that are willing to give private investors a first look and give them kind of first chance at like buying businesses before they hit the market. So that means they have like special customers. Yeah. So let's say I have a seller that comes to us and says, look, I want to sell my business. 
We go, great. And while we're kind of going through the process of checking out the business, we bring that business before it's on the market, we bring it to a small group of investors that we know buy businesses quickly and easily and have plenty of cash. So look, here's this deal. Do you want to buy it? And so let's say that an offer is made. It's often a low ball offer. Right. Because these are professional business buyers. Sure. And the problem is that the broker works with these buyers regularly. So they have a relationship that's not hands off. And they take that offer and pressure the seller into selling the business pre going to market. Even presenting the offer itself is a form of pressure. And from a broker's perspective, right? Like we're transactional. We want to do transactions. We don't get paid really until the transaction is done. So like we want to get deals done. And if it sells for 10 or 20% less, it's bad for the seller, not so bad for us. This is something sellers need to take into account. They need to have a number in their head. This is probably one of the only areas I think where brokers aren't aligned with sellers is that, you know, it sells 10, 20% less. It's not a big hit to the broker. It can be a big hit to the seller. So in this scenario, like they're not even going to market. It's not shared with like a wider audience. The red line for me is that we will never do off-market deals or pre-market. We'll never do that. Let's step back and I want to try to set up a little bit of a timeline so people can understand where you're at. And the first thing is, can you let us know like the scope of the company? Like what does the company look like? So we're a totally distributed team. We have some salespeople and operations people right now in Prague. There's a few of us in Chiang Mai. We've got some people in Saigon and Manila in Medellin, Colombia, a couple of people in the United States. And we've got a team of 25 or so in the Philippines, you know, in the south of the Philippines in Davao City. So your total team size is? Right around 57, 58 people today. How might you describe the type of marketplace or deals of volume that are going through the Empire Flippers marketplace? So it's grown a lot. I mean, three years ago, I think we did like four and a half million dollars in total sales of websites and online businesses. This year, we're going to be really close to maybe 33 to 36 million in total sales. That comes out to be about $4 million in fees, the fees that we collect from selling the actual businesses. We typically take anywhere from 8 to 15%, depending on deal size. So over the years, you guys have been moving up and up market in terms of the deal size. Give me a sense for like a median business that sells. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about moving up. We had a kind of like a state of the company meeting with our entire team last night. One of the things we talked about was like, we want to grow next year. We don't know exactly how much, but I gave an example. I said, look, let's say our goal was 70% growth next year. That sounds scary. Because if you think, oh, if we did, you know, 200 deals this year, we'll do a little bit more than that. But let's say we did 200 deals, that would mean we need to do 340 deals next year to get 70% growth. But that's not true because we not only can grow in the number of deals, we can grow in the size of deals. So if we do 30% more deals, instead of 200, we did 260. And we grow by 30% in volume. Instead of a $150,000 average, we do $195,000 average. That gets us 69% growth, effectively 70% growth. So I was trying to explain to them that's a, a way to do it. And to that point, Dan, that's a lot of how we've grown over the years. We're doing more deals, but the average size of the deals has grown. I mean, years ago, it was 10,000. What's your value prop right now to someone who wants to sell a $5 million business, for example? Because to me, it's like, you know, I've sold a sub $100,000 business with you and it was like crystal clear why I would sell on Empire Flippers because you have an enormous audience. But now if I'm selling a five or $10 million business, it's not as crystal clear to me right now. So what do you have to say to the top of the market there? Not, that's not the top of the market, but this, these larger players. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember I talked a couple of years ago to your business partner, Ian, about selling your guys' business, your e-commerce business. So for some context, this conversation probably would have taken place in mid to late 2013, and we're talking about this e-commerce business that Ian and I previously owned that designed and created valet parking products and mobile cocktail bars, among other things. And at the time, we listed it for multiple seven figures. This was several years ago, and I think the largest deal we'd done at that point was maybe... 200,000 or something. And he came to me and said, look, I'm wondering like what we should do. We're serious about selling our business. And I told him, I said, look, I just, I don't think we can do that today. I mean, I think it's outside of the scope of what we're able to do. 
Joe didn't love that. Joe didn't love that. He didn't love that. But I thought it was true at the time. I'm not sure that it was. I don't know if it was true versus my fear, right, of like how to handle that deal. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure which it is. It's interesting now that I look back. I would say that I'm comfortable up to five, six million right now with the customers that we have. If someone came and said, look, I have a $15, $20 million deal. I don't know. I mean, we have a lot of private equity guys reaching out to us, but we'd have to do it differently. It would be, I guess my answer is, is that I feel like our limit right now is five, six million. I'm comfortable there. I think we can get those deals done. I know we have buyers for it and, and we've done, you know, we're working on a just under $4 million deal right now. So I'm, I'm comfortable there. A $20 million deal, I wouldn't be comfortable. Could we do it? Possibly. Today, I still feel like it's outside of our range. What are the real moments in a business valuation that things change? Yeah, there's some break points. I would say, you know, anything under $100,000 is all cash. A lot of times it's newbies or it's maybe small, tiny portfolios, partners that have a portfolio of a dozen businesses and they're buying $70,000 affiliate sites. $100,000 to $500,000, it's a little more serious. You're generally going to have some kind of earn out period. It's not going to be all cash. It can be, but it might have some earn out. It might have some an investor involved. Anything from like five hundred thousand to five million, it absolutely is going to have some piece of earn out. Generally, some type of seller financing. It's going to have some investors involved. Like they're going to have to pull cash out of something else. Like no one's just cashed up for three million, right? Like they're going to have to get some of the money elsewhere. So that's an interesting space. Oh, and it's also too small for like private equity investment banks. So like a $3 million deal, they buy that and it doubles. It doesn't move the needle for their portfolio. It doesn't matter to them, right? So a $20 million deal and they double or triple that business. Now we're talking like it changes the dynamic of their portfolio. It moves the needle. So there's this kind of like no man's land from like, you know, 500,000 to 5 million where there's not a ton of cash and a lot of times the cash is the money's cobbled together to do the deal. Seems like there's more interest though in that space. There's more interest because there's more deals available. The big money doesn't want to play, so you have to kind of cobble money together from small money. Where is that money coming from? Well, that's interesting. I think it's a really it's a new thing in our industry where you're starting to see these kind of like mini funds get put together. There's a lot of uh, like business stuff I want to talk about, but I want to talk about you a little bit. Did you become an entrepreneur to solve a problem in your life or were you a natural? I didn't see myself as an entrepreneur back in the day. I mean, I was, when I was younger, I didn't see that I had an opportunity to kind of create my own path. I wrongly, maybe naively thought that I was blowing in the wind, right? So, you know, kind of what happened to me is I, I deal with life as it comes at you. And it's weird to look back at that person because I'm that's so wrong. I was so wrong about that. I went in the Navy, right, with the hopes of you know making some money to finish college and, and kind of take that path. And I just kind of figured my success in the Navy or even afterwards would just be dependent on people making decisions for me, like saying, oh, you did this well or you didn't do this well. I would advance or not advance based on what other people thought and what other people considered my successes or failures. It's kind of binary, join the Navy or not, right? When I get out, I do this or do that, when there's so many other options. And that's, that was fascinating. I'm not sure exactly when I got to the point where I figured out that you can you know, write your own path, you can create your own path, but that was impactful. Do you remember when you met Joe? I do, yeah. I met him, I was in San Diego. This is like post-Navy? No, 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 I was in the Navy. You were in the Navy. I was in the Navy, hanging out with some buddies. <laughs> How old are you? What year is this? God, I was a baby. Uh, <laughs> this is probably 97. 97. Are you wearing like the white outfit? Oh, man. I don't know. I don't know what I was wearing. Some Hawaiian shirt on the beach. I don't know. But I go with my Navy buddies to the beach, and we'd hang out and you know sneak drinks. I was underage and you know drink when we could. And and met up with Joe, and we had kind of like our Navy friends and our non-Navy friends. We kind of all hung out together. It's a big group of us. And, you know, we go down to Tijuana and get our party on at 19 and, you know, go over the border and drink and, and party. And that's when we met. And then we were friends for years after that. 
you know, Joe went up to San Francisco. And I was still in the Navy and then um, got a job working for a startup there. Ended up in New York. Came back to San Diego. Things didn't go well. This is around 2000, I think September 11th, shortly after that. He's in New York at the time and things weren't going well. I mean, I think he'd lost both his high paying jobs. And I think we were like, hey, man, come back to San Diego. It's great weather. <laughs> we're here. Come back out with us. Were you guys talking about business at that time? No. What was your life outlook at this moment? You know, 2001. Yeah, 2001. I mean, I got out of the Navy in 2002. I remember looking at border patrol jobs, right? Because that's a, a not uncommon thing for people getting out of the military to go into the border patrol. But I was looking at that for a job, right? And I, I got a benefit because I you know, was a veteran or whatever. I ended up in school going to college and I was getting paid because I had paid extra money into the GI Bill and the college fund and the top up fund or whatever. So I was able to make some money going to college, which is fantastic. And I was older at this point. So I took it more seriously than I probably would have at 18 or 19. Jesus, that would have gone badly. (laughs) Joe was working for a mortgage company and making good money. And I was getting paid to go to college and I had like a drop shipping business. God, this is a 2004. Yes. I had heard about it from someone and realized that you can drop ship on eBay. So people were, at, at the time it was Baby G Watches was one of the things I was drop shipping. I don't know if you remember, those were super popular. Uh huh. Some fake Chinese drills, <laughs> so like DeWalt drills, and you could like buy them in China and they look similar and you could, I was buying them for like $40, $50 and selling them for $150. Wow. And then I got into jewelry for a bit. So I was selling some jewelry from a, a US drop shipper. I actually had a site designed, and I had a website. It was called dealingforyou.com. <laughs> That's fantastic. Did it have a four? Oh, my God. It was so terrible. Were you making money? Maybe on a bad month, 600 bucks, and a good month, maybe 1800 something like that. So uh, supportive of like you know the money I was making from college and the Navy stuff. And then Joe was working for this mortgage company. He started working there, and he learned sales there, right? There's this guy named Peter Stern, fantastic sales guy. Joe said, look, I'm making money at this job. You should come out, uh, get a job here, and you know it's fantastic. So I left school to go do that and joined this company. They took me on. We started selling mortgages, and this was like leading up to the heyday of well, the fall of all the mortgage stuff. The only people that I've ever seen that sell mortgages were those two guys in the big short movie that were down in Florida. Yeah. Was that like, were you guys like those guys? I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to say. Were you guys like, we are selling these mortgages like hotcakes and we're making a lot of money? Yes. Kinda? We learned a lot from Peter. And so we didn't know much about the mortgage industry. We learned about the mortgage industry and kind of how it works. People were refinancing their homes. A lot of people were stuck with like higher interest rates. So they were on like eight, nine percent interest rates from years in the past. And, you know, rates were good. I think you get like five, six percent interest rates. So and then we learned kind of the sales process and like the Ben Franklin close. And that's basically a you've never heard of this? <laughs> Give me a funny look. What is it? The Ben Franklin close is to, you know, take a piece of paper, put a line down the middle. On one side, put kind of the good positive reasons for doing something. On the right hand, put kind of the negative reasons, the downsides. And, you know, when you're talking about greed, people tend to put a hell of a lot more or more things on the, I mean, this is an actual thing you can use to make a decision, but when you're doing it for like greedy purposes, all the positive and the stuff like kind of builds up in your mind, you're like, Ooh, that's a, there's a lot of good over here. And the negatives don't seem nearly as bad. So you're walking your client through this to try to sell them on something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So are you guys like in a boiler room kind of atmosphere? I'll give you an example. So I'm on the phone, I have my earbuds in, I'm on a call. And if it makes you feel any better, I used to sell chemical lawn treatments. Fun stuff. So when you're on a good call and you're on a sales call, or either you're trying to get their social, which is a big sticking point, you need their social security number because you need to run their credit to see if they qualify for the loan. So on the first call, it's normally a two call close. The first call you're getting their social, that's a sticking point. And then obviously when you call them back to talk about what they can do and how it works, that's the sales call and that can be a battle. So sometimes when getting a social or when trying to do the sales call, you would stand up, right? Because your voice actually sounds different when you stand up. And we're doing this right now. I'm looking at you and you're kind of like standing up straight. And I noticed your voice sounds different. Putting your chest out a little bit, right? It gets different. When you stand up, it gets different. 
And so we would stand up when we're in like a heated sales call. And so what Peter had is he had this you know, tool where he could like pop into your line and hear what they're saying. And so Peter sometimes from across the room, literally across the boiler room, air quotes, would see and like tell everyone else to basically just shut up, right? And then just focus in on your deal. He would say, he's like, wait, wait for this. Now say this and like literally feed you lines and you would hear, like you could hear their mind working. I would ask them, so that makes sense to you, right? And they would pause and then you'd hear them go, and you're like, I'm winning them over, man. I'm winning them. It was, there's something glorious about doing that kind of sale. It was in the mortgage industry where Joe and I got some sales chops and I'd never learned that before. Now it was guys like us and (laughs) doing a lot of the deals, particularly the shadier deals that didn't help the mortgage industry, but we learned a lot in the process and made some money. So you made shady deals. What's, what's that mean? Well, I'd say shady in the fact that we had, uh, oh, I'm going to speak for him. I don't care. Joe, don't get mad at me about this. <laughs> Joe was, it was uh, the last deal of the month. And if he got the deal through, then like all the money he made on all other deals, it was like his fifth deal or whatever for the month. And if he, he would get, make a lot more money on the other deals he'd already done. And so, he was trying to get this notary to go out to this house, right, to get the doc signed. Because if the docs get signed that day, then he's good. It's like the last day of the month. Notary is like, he's like, look, I'll kick you some extra money. Just come on, go out to this house, get it done. And she goes out there and then she like, I think she stepped outside and called back and was like, look, I mean, I was in the house. There's like weed strewn about the table. There's like bongs lying around. I don't know about this, guys. I don't know. And, and Joe's like, come on, just get the deal done. <laughs> and uh, she goes back in, gets the doc signed. And, you know, uh, it's like, okay, man, thank God. So it's not shady, but it's like, that just, it seems, that's a weird deal to do, right? We're like begging a notary. She's paying her more money to go sneak into this house where the signer's probably stoned out of her head. Do you remember the moment when that job and industry went away? Yes. So, we were no longer working for like that small company. And we didn't understand the back end of how these deals worked at all, that they were being packaged and sold. We didn't learn that after. So we'd left working that small company and had basically gone off on our own. And Joe and I were acting as brokers and we were doing business in a bunch of different states. We were getting deals done, making money, and we saw a turn. And this is like, I think 2007, And we saw a turn in the market where deals that would previously be relatively easy to get done, they started not funding them or they started to change their requirements or they started to reject deals that were previously a no-brainer for them. We remember thinking, you know, this is weird. I mean, why do they not want these deals? It doesn't make a lot of sense. So we actually saw this happening pre-crash, right? And so looking back now, it's easy in hindsight, but at the time we were like on the very edge of like the financial crisis and saw some weird shit happening where like banks weren't taking deals anymore. Interesting. So you could have, could have, I'm sure if we were cashed up and had, you know, solid brains on our heads, we could have probably made some money on that. Like, absolutely. But we saw that before it all went down and looking back, it was, it's interesting to, I'll tell you this, we look today for opportunities like that. I was going to ask you, because you've been through a, a few of these ups and downs. Do you see anything now? Not really. I mean, I can't, no. I don't have anything professionally that I'm like, ooh, I think I see something here. I mean, I can say that the real estate market is changing a bit right now, that things are a little tougher there. I haven't seen anything in our industry. We had a bad month in October, but November looks great. I can tell you that if in our industry we saw capital start to dry up, and people were not buying deals at the rate they were. They were saving the cash for other things or whatever. I think that would be interesting. Today's show is sponsored by Ahrefs. I know many of you love and use Ahrefs. And for those of you listening right now, we got a special offer for you today. So stick around. If you don't know, Ahrefs is the number one go-to tool for optimizing SEO traffic results because of their enormous backlinks index. I would have killed for something like this 10 years ago when I was getting started in SEO. But Ahrefs is a whole lot more sophisticated and comprehensive than that. 
It's actually a full suite of SEO tools, sort of like a Swiss army knife of SEO. So whether you need to run a technical site audit, do competitor research, or identify high-value keyword opportunities, Ahrefs does it all. So if you want to rank higher in Google and send your search traffic through the roof, go check out Ahrefs today. It's at www.ahrefs.com. They run a seven-day trial for just $7. So you could sign up for Ahrefs and see what this enormously comprehensive tool can do for just seven bucks. And here's what's better. For one listener of today's episode, they're offering a free light annual account worth nearly $1,000. All you need to do is tweet at Ahrefs and at Tropical MBA, letting us know why you deserve to win. And big ups to Ahrefs for that generous offer and for sponsoring today's show. So let's get back to Joe and Justin's story. Did the sales training have an effect on your view of yourself as an entrepreneur? Yes, for sure. I think the sales training gave me some level of confidence that I can do this with anything. If you can sell, you can sell anything. And that's freeing. I think that was the first time Joe and I started a business. I hesitate to call it a business now, but we were. We started a mortgage business effectively where you know, we started to hire people. We started to put SOPs in place. We had an SOP for hiring. We hired our first person from the Philippines, a virtual assistant. And this is before Odesk or Upwork or any of those companies or services. What year was this? This is 2005, 2006. Pre-four-hour work week. Pre-four-hour work week. We got a little lucky with the Philippines and with the person we hired who was fantastic. And she would put other job ads out to hire mortgage people to work for us. And so she was a part of an SOP for hiring loan officers to come and work for Joe and I. And so we had a new hire document that kind of like showed them what we were doing and how it works. It's incredible. This was, yeah, it's a long time ago. <laughs> it's a long time ago, but we already were starting. I mean, we have a lot of those things in place now, right, for our business, but those were the early workings of what it would later become. So I think it was around that time that I became more intentional about what I was doing with work. And I think, I'm speaking for Joe here, but I think it was probably similar for him. So you're selling these mortgages. You got the SOPs going. You're starting a legitimate business. You're not just generating an income for yourself, but you're paying out to other people. You know, everybody knows what happened in 2008. Like, do you guys have any sort of personal wealth at this time? No, not much. And we were going through it pretty quickly because we weren't able to get the deals done. Our lifestyles weren't cheap. And we were spending savings. I think at this point, we were probably making a couple thousand dollars a month each or whatever and you know, spending five or six. And so going through savings, I got down to where I had hardly any savings left. So I was out of money. I remember a time... My buddy was getting married and we were going to go on his bachelor party and I couldn't afford the fee to go on his bachelor party. Like that sucks. That was, I think that was like probably late spring, early summer of 2007, I think. So what did you do about it? Got a job, man. I knew that I wasn't done, but I needed a break. Like I was happy to go manage something or run like a small team. I, I still wanted some responsibility. I didn't want all the responsibility. I felt like, because you know, when you run a business, you're responsible for finances, accounting, customer service, you know, employee management, like you're just responsible for every single thing. Keeping the lights on. Yeah. And if I could just go back to like, okay, I run a customer service team, you know what I mean? And like, we, I, I can do that. Like, I don't want everything. I want 20% of it. And that's effectively what I went to go do. I, went, I found a job with an interesting company, did local SEO, and they were growing like crazy. So I went and started with them. I started off as a sales manager, running a small sales team. And then a couple months later, I ended up a division manager, so running some stuff in operations. So quickly, I think they realized, like, wow, this guy is good. Like, he can really help our business and deserves more responsibility and, and can run shit, right? And I mentioned to Joe who on the other side, he had more savings than I did. I think he had maybe 20, 30 grand or something. 
And he took that and started bankrolling poker. Those were the days when you could make money playing poker. Yeah. And it wasn't all crazy like it is today, right? So he was making some money playing poker, but not very fulfilled. He was like, kind of like, wow, that sounds kind of cool. That sounds better. Like, it sounds more interesting. So you got him out of the poker life into the local SEO. Yeah. He got me into the mortgage business and I was like, return the favor. I was like, hey, man, there's something good going on over here. You and I work well together, even though our business sucked. Like, we together were, I think, a good team. And so I was like, why don't you come work over here? So he went over there and I think he started off as like, started in sales at first and he did some sales and hated it. He was not interested in doing sales. Ended up in like the night supervisor. We had a night crew. He's running like an operation team as a night supervisor. And within a couple of months of that, he got promoted a couple of times too. And within, I'd say four to six months of him being on, now maybe I'd been there a year, we were running probably... 70% of their operational team. And we kind of built back our confidence. We learned a lot. We had some great mentors at this company that I think really helped us to the next level, like helped us with working with people, with building teams, with building out process that we didn't didn't learn on our own for the mortgage business. So how do you end up in Davao? Davao is a city in the south of the Philippines. So Joe and I were running the operations for this local SEO company. And we kind of maintain our connection with our virtual assistant in the Philippines. And at this local SEO company, they were hiring like crazy. Like a warm body comes in, they would hire them, both on the sales side and the operations side because they were growing so quickly. They were just, you know, and Temecula doesn't have the most amazing job talent pool. They come in, we just, we need people. And, you know, we mentioned to our boss at the time, it was the CEO, CFO, COO, we were telling them, look, we've got this connection to the Philippines. We have this like kind of like a low level. It was like a categorization task where people had to take these businesses and determine what category they went into. And AI was not great at the time. So it really just required someone actually choosing. But it is a really rote job. It's not exciting. But we need someone to do it. And we said, look, we've got this connection to the Philippines. I think they'll do it. It's relatively cheap. You want to test it out? And they said, yeah. So we hired three people in the Philippines to do this kind of like categorization task of these local businesses. And they were banging through it and they did a really good job. We said, look, why don't we expand that a little bit to some other tasks that we have, some like basic tasks and have them do it. And so they said, sure. So we got like seven or eight people, Filipinos, working kind of on these kind of back office processes for this company. So we said, look, we should go to the Philippines and check it out. They loved it because it was much cheaper. I think, you know, on average, it was like 10% of the employee cost of the people that were in the U.S. and Temecula, like 10%. Now, what's your mindset when you're suggesting this plan? Are you thinking like, hell yeah, I get to get out of the office? Or are you thinking like, are you like company hero at this point? Like, this is the right thing for our organization kind of thing. Company hero, but Joe and I had a plan. So we went out to the Philippines, right? And we met with the small team we had there. And the people that were that were working for us were working out of their managers, the, the original girl. They were working out of her house. Some of them were in a closet. <laughs> so she literally had like a closet, like a plastic table and chairs in there, like an air conditioning blowing. It was, it was like crazy. We were like, wow, we're running a sweatshop in the Philippines. So we go back and Joe and I are, are having a conversation about what to do about this and how to make this an opportunity. We said, look, you know, we think we can heavily expand the team offshore. Joe and I were we were in an Outback Steakhouse hanging out. So we sit down and we say, look, what if we could make dollars and spend pesos? That'd be fantastic, right? We could live a really good life in Asia making a U.S. salary. I'd love to do that. How do we make that happen? So we knew that the company was very happy with what we'd done offshore. So... I ended up talking to my mentor and boss at the time, who was a halftime COO, which is weird, but he's a halftime COO. And he said, look, that's fantastic. Put a plan together. Take it out of your head. Take it out of this conversation. We were like a Korean barbecue having lunch. I lay it out to him. And he says, look, put it on PowerPoint, right? Lay out what you want to do. And we did. And then he, I went back to him and we showed him it to him and we tweaked it a bit. And then Joe and I brought it to the CEO, CFO, how to sit down with them in the, the boardroom. And we're in the boardroom with our bosses and kind of like laying out our plan to set up an outsourcing company 
and offshore a bunch of the work. So they were going to be your anchor client. Yes. Did you offer to save them the money on your own salary, for example, or what were some of the key parts of the plan? Yeah. So as we saw it, we didn't want, because it'd be problematic for us to say, hey, let's lay off our own staff and then build this offshore staff. Like that's just, that's not cool. So our plan was to build the offshore staff through attrition. So as people leave, and it was still growing too, that the company was growing. So as they needed, we would hire in the Philippines. As people left, we'd replace some of those jobs offshore. You know, the plan showed how much we would save and exactly kind of how that would work. I think it was middle, the end of 2009. We had a contract done up. That was a no cut contract effectively. And we said, look, if we're going to take this, this is a risk from our perspective, pretty heavy risk. We want to save you this money. We know that we can get this done. You've seen what we've been able to do in the Philippines. I think we had 10 to 12 people in the Philippines at that point. And, you know, we had them presented the contract and they had a, you know, a company lawyer and they looked it over and we said, look, you know, we want to make sure that we're not going to take this huge risk and just a week later we're out right? you stop paying or something and just we're completely screwed for us to take this leap we're going to need some measure of because you need to be able to pay these people sure and we're you know moving halfway around the world you know i'd been in the navy before i traveled joe and i had been to asia before like you know for the philippines to take a look so, you know, I had been before, but I had moved there. Right. Like, you know what I mean? And sold my stuff and packed my bags and like try to get an apartment in the Philippines. Like I was new. We had them do a guarantee where it was a guaranteed contract for a couple of years. We were absolutely going to get this a certain amount of money. They could only cut back to a certain degree. Like it was, we felt confident. And so Joe went over there toward the end of 2009. I stayed in the U.S. through the end of 2009. And I was a contractor. I went into the office almost every day, but just as a contractor now. So we had you know, signed off in HR, we'd quit our jobs, and we were contractors for our previous employer. Joe was over there in the Philippines, kind of on the ground, setting everything up. And I was not so happy in the US continuing to come into the office. And I just didn't love that piece. Well, why'd you stay back? I hated it and just wasn't happy. And so. I think you felt like Joe was the one that was having all the fun. Yeah. He was like doing this big adventure and you were yes. in Temecula. I'm in Temecula, same place. We're growing our business, but I'm just hanging on to Temecula. I hated it. So I was like, look, I got to go. And I said, suck it. I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I'm going. That's it. I went to the Philippines and, and within 12 months, hell, not even that long, three or four months in, they start cutting back. They were not stopped growing effectively said, look, our growth was false because we didn't grow properly. So we need to back it down. And so as contractors, it's pretty easy to start cutting us out, right? They also probably weren't happy that we'd worked with some of their competitors. Some of the people that had previously worked there had some competitive shops and we started working with them. They probably weren't happy with that either. But anyway, they started cutting our contract back significantly. Were you like, I'm out of the Philippines? This is, it's over? There was a time at which, so it got worse and worse. Like we'd add a couple of clients, but every time we'd add a new client, they would cut back. And so it was like, we weren't really growing. We were staying the same or even declining a little bit in terms of the business and, and how we were doing. And these new clients were less, even less stable, right? Than our kind of big client. And we had no leverage against our previous employer. And they had us by the balls, quite honestly. You just had a contract, but they don't care. Yeah, no one cares about contracts. I mean, if your business is in trouble or you're struggling or you, you know, you're trying to keep your business afloat, which they that was the boat they were in, like are you going to let a contract put you out of business? So we had to have a tough conversation about what to do because it got to the point where I mean there were months we Joe and I didn't pay ourselves and there was a point at which we had to shut down our office in the Philippines. And I was like, "Wow, we shut down an office and we tell everyone to go home and work from home. What kind of fucking losers are we?" Like that we're not a real company anymore and we're probably going to end up going back home. So we were considering that. Like what if we had to do that? What if we were stuck doing that? But we'd started kind of our new business at the time, which was AdSense Slippers. This was end of 2010. And we started building out. We said, what are we going to do with these people? When they finally got rid of us completely, we'd let go of some people and laid off some people from our Philippines company. But what do we do with these people that are now still there? They're, these are the best of the best. These are the talented people we don't want to get rid of. 
Can we do something with them until we can get them in other jobs and other roles? So we looked for multiple things. You know, Mechanical Turk. I don't know if you're familiar with Amazon, like Mechanical Turk. It's it was basically a service that Amazon had where you can do these small, tiny projects, kind of like pre Fiverr or whatever, and you get paid little bits of money for it. And we said, look, I figure we were paying them maybe like a buck something an hour. What was your nut? Like, what do you need to get to? We needed to make like a buck fifty an hour to pay their salary or something like that. And so we we can just make a buck fifty an hour to pay their salary. But we're going to get them placed with another client within three to six months. Like we'll continue growing the outsourcing company and we'll get them placed. We just don't want to come out of pocket for that because that's keeping us from getting paid every month. And you know, like we're having to pay for them. And we tried it. It was like thirty five cents an hour or something. We were able to make like, oh god, that's not going to. That's stupid. We shouldn't do that. We tried other things, and one of the things was building these little niche AdSense sites. Like we figured, we found out how to build, how to do keyword research to basically find keywords that were underserved, right? That didn't have quality websites, that didn't have people talking about it. So it's a fake one, but cat constipation was one. Right. We had a site called catconstipation.net or something like that. So people were searching on Google for cat constipation, wanted more information about it. If we could provide content around that, we can put up you know, Google AdSense, which you know, advertisers pay Google, and they pay you per click. And we put up these small little websites with advertisements on them. And, and we didn't know if it was going to work, but we were testing it out with our team. And we figured out we could build these small websites profitably and get them earning money. At first, it was just to save our employee program until we can get them placed somewhere else. Do you remember the moment the like, words AdSense flippers jumped out of your collective consciousness? I don't remember. I remember that I started this like November 2010, me personally doing a couple. And then Joe was like, well, look, we can have our team do it now. And then so we started expanding to our team. And it was like maybe through March. And there was a point at which we said, you know, we'd put like maybe 10 grand into it, right? In terms of building the sites and, and the costs. And I was like, Joe, I think maybe it's working. Like, I think maybe we should like put more money into it. And we fought about like whether we should or shouldn't. And so ultimately, we came to the good idea, I think, to try and sell some. Like if we sell some of these little profitable websites off, you know, if it's making 50 bucks a month, we sell it for $1,000. Take that $1,000, reinvest in, in building out more of these sites. And so we started doing that around March of 2011. And we started the blog right around May of 2011. And the only thing we were thinking was that We'll talk about our process, exactly what we're doing, how much money it makes, how it makes money, and then we will direct people to our, and we were selling on Flippa at the time, we'll direct some of the people that are interested in that to our Flippa auctions. Did you guys, like at that moment, you were like, my heels are dug in, we're not going back? No. There was a point though at which maybe late 2011 or summer or like fall of 2011 where we realized okay we're on to something here people are interested in this our audience was growing it was something that i think resonated and so we i think at that point we realized this might end up being a business that we roll with why then change from adsense flippers to empire flippers we'd stop building sites ourselves and we allowed other people to sell their websites with us. And some of those were monetized via AdSense. But there's lots of other types of online businesses. You know, we have a post about the 11 different online business models. And it includes Amazon FBA. It includes drop shipping. It includes e-commerce. It includes Kindle eBooks, right? There's just so many ways to make money online and through online businesses that AdSense was just limiting. It was limiting, I think, for what we wanted to do. And so if we want to sell Amazon Associate affiliate businesses, it'd be weird to be the AdSense flippers. This is a smaller concern, but like we also were having trouble having Google Apps on AdSense flippers. Like that didn't work. <laughs> that, was, that was a pain. They don't want AdSense in the name. Right. So that wasn't great. But more it was because we thought it was limiting and we thought we were broadening our horizon. Do you remember the date that like, it clicked for you guys that you were going to be this thing. You were going to be this platform for buying and selling businesses instead of these people who are simply trying to pay the rent and trying to find something that's resonating. Yes. I don't remember which came first, but there were two distinct points I remember. One of them was a talk we did at DC Bangkok. 
I think it might have been 2013 or 2014, I'm not sure. Joe and I did a talk about how we were dumping everything else we were doing. It was like $15,000 a month or something we had coming in from all these other projects. We were doing keyword research for people. We were doing content for people. So you still had like outsourcing stuff going on. Yes, we still had outsourcing stuff going on. We had a couple of other like side businesses and stuff. And we just dumped everything. And we did a talk about it. And it was a weird talk to do because we didn't have the outcome. We didn't know what was going to happen. I think actually in the talk we said, you know, how is this going to work out? We really don't know. We feel like it's right check back with us. We'll let you know. We'd thrown shit against the wall for a while. 15 years, it sounds like. And we found something that stuck, but it resonated with people. It was interesting to people. And like, it felt a little like a tiger by the tail and everything else was unimportant. So dump it. That's what was ringing in our heads. So yeah, that's what we did. What do you worry about now? You know, now fast forward four more years we got 60 people on the team. We're responsible for a lot more people. We're responsible for them feeding themselves, feeding their families. Some of them take the money they make with us and send it home or take care of relatives, take care of kids. And so that can be stressful, right? Because there are a lot of people that need what we're doing. And it's a lot less scary. Like it's not early days when we made a change like the business could live or die on any decision you make. It was like, it was crazy. And you could pivot in a minute, right? So Joe and I are like, well, we're doing it this way. Well, let's just change the SOP. We're doing it that way now. It was super easy to change. It's not as easy to change now because there's just a lot more infrastructure built around stuff. I think it's fair to say you live a pretty nomadic lifestyle. You're running this big company. A lot of your staff does too. How often do you fantasize about just roping everybody into an office and making it legit it's funny you mentioned that making it legit i'm not worried about that anymore i was when we lost our office in the philippines i thought that that's what required to be legit i don't feel that way now like that's not even a concern over the years joe and i have wondered that we've kind of maybe daydreamed about that or we had people ask us about that what if you set up an office in the u.s don't you think you'd make more money right don't you think you'd be more successful for the business and there's really two things to that number one I don't know that it would, right? Because our team generally buys into the fact that there's real value and benefit in being nomadic. We've got happy people. We've got happy people on the team. We do a lot of business in person. We have a niche in kind of like the expat entrepreneurial scene. Like We sell a lot of businesses as part of that community. And so part of the benefits of being nomadic is we get to meet these people in person in Barcelona. We get to meet these people in Medellin. We get to meet them in So like there's real advantages to that and our team's happy. The second thing is, you know, Joe and I feel like the business should serve our interests, right? Like it should serve our interests. And now that we have a much larger team, serve the interest of our team. And like we're, none of us are really interested in doing that. Joe and I in particular, we don't want to do that. And so why do something? I mean, there's some things I have to do, sure, but that's a big decision. Like going to, you know, Tampa, and setting up an office in some like shitty office space that's like in some suburbia, you know, low hanging ceiling office. That sucks, dude. I'm not interested in that. And so we want the business to serve our needs. That's just it. The business ought to serve us so long as you're doing a great job for your customers. That's the magic here. There is this temptation, you know, to do things like the way you're, quote, supposed to do things. You know, at a certain point, you should grow up and get an office in a major city, bring in a serious CEO. But the fact is, is what I'm seeing in our community is people are sticking to their guns. They're doing things their way. And sometimes that can make all the difference in terms of the edge that your business has in the marketplace. So it's really cool to see companies doing things in their own unique way, even as they approach what is a pretty impressive scale. I hope you dug this conversation with Justin. I appreciate him sitting down with me. I've been wanting to do this for a long time, and it was cool to be able to sit in the same room with him 
and hear a little bit about his backstory and where it all came from. Let us know your comments on this one. Show notes, links, comment section, everything will be posted over at tropicalmba.com slash empire flippers. And we'll be back next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.